1996, a hacker by the name of Aleph One wrote a paper titled Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit for Frack Magazine. This paper was a step-by-step -step tutorial on exploiting a little-known memory corruption bug called a buffer overflow. This vulnerability could, in many cases, give execution to the attacker, allowing them to run arbitrary code on a vulnerable machine. Though the buffer overflow vulnerability had been known all the way back in the 1970s, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit was the best article breaking down the nuts and bolts of how to exploit a buffer overflow. In this video, we're going to try to channel Aleph One and discuss what a basic buffer overflow is and how it works. In the next videos, we're going to build upon that knowledge and learn how to execute more complicated and powerful buffer overflows. As there are many architecture-dependent ideas, we're going to focus on x86-64 as 32-bit x86 is starting to disappear. Additionally, x86-64 has the benefit of having more in common with RISC architectures such as ARM and MIPS in case we ever look at those architectures as well. The term buffer overflow is a bit misleading. It refers specifically to a buffer on the stack. However, you could technically have a chunk of memory on the heap that you might call a buffer. In this video, when we say buffer overflow, we mean a buffer allocated on the stack, not anywhere else in memory. Though buffer overflows are possible in these memory regions, they require different techniques. But what is a stack? To understand buffer overflows, we must first understand the stack data structure. Every program is given several regions of memory to use for data storage. One of these regions is a chunk of memory in the program's address space called the stack. The stack is a linear data structure that follows the principle of last in, first out. This means the last element placed into the stack is the first element to come out. Subsequently, the first thing placed into the stack is always the last thing to come out. To retrieve an element from the stack, you must always remove the elements on top of it. The address of the top of the stack is always pointed to by the special purpose register RSP. Other architectures also have their own specialized stack register. Wait a minute, what's with the name RSP? Well, back in the day, during the 8086 Intel series, the registers were only 16 bits long. During this time, the stack pointer was referred to as just SP for stack pointer. During the 8386 series, registers became 32 bits long. And to designate the new size, they started putting an E prefix, which stood for extended in front of the name. So the stack pointer became ESP. Then later on, when registers became 64 bits, they got an R prefix added to them instead of the E prefix. And the R just stands for register. And that means that the stack pointer became RSP. In x86-64, the stack has special instructions, such as push and pop, for placing data onto and off of the stack. Modern compilers will almost entirely forego the use of push and pop. Instead, they favor pre-allocating all the needed stack space in the beginning of the function, and using the move instruction instead of push and pop. You don't have to worry about this right now, I just mention it so that you're aware that you might not see push and pop in your disassembly. Now let's take a look at how these instructions work with the stack. When we push a register to the stack, such as RAX, we're pushing the value of RAX to the stack. Push doesn't have to refer to a register. We can push an immediate value to the stack as well. In this animation, we do that with the hex value of five. Notice that when we push, we write the data at the address pointed to by RSP, and RSP gets updated. Remember, RSP is always the top of the stack. If it's not obvious, pop does the opposite of push. It takes the value pointed to by RSP and places it in the register indicated in the instruction. Then, RSP is updated to point to the previous item in the stack. Whenever we do a push, RSP gets some number of bytes subtracted from it. Every time we pop, RSP gets some number of bytes added to it. This means that as the stack grows in size, the register RSP will point to lower and lower addresses. In fact, unlike in the animation, the values on the stack are never actually removed. Instead, RSP is just subtracted from. Those values will simply get overwritten the next time some new value is pushed onto the stack. Great, so every program gets a stack, and that stack is pointed to by RSP. But what ends up on the stack? How do we know when data goes to the stack as opposed to somewhere else? The answer is pretty simple. Anything that's in a local variable of a function will end up on the stack. In this example, both A and B will end up on the stack, with A being pushed to the stack first and B being pushed on the stack second. In this next example, though buffer is allocated using malloc putting the data on the heap, the pointer to the data lives on the stack and it will be pushed onto the stack after B. 
But what about something a little bit more complicated, like a string object? Well, the string object's members get stored on the stack just like anything else. However, the object may manage some internal memory, such as the actual string stored, and store that into the heap. Let's take a look at another example where we can start using this information. We'll write a quick, simple program that'll allow us to demonstrate abusing the stack. Let's create two variables, a, which is an integer, it'll be set to 10, and buff, which will be a character array of length 16. The length isn't really important, it's just a number I picked. We'll prompt the reader to give us some data, and then we'll read in that data using the scanf function. If you're unfamiliar with scanf, it's a simple function in C that allows you to read formatted text from standard input. In this example, we'll use the percent %s format specifier, which means to read a string, but the percent %s specifier doesn't have a limit on the number of bytes that it will read into our buffer. This means that when the program is run and the user types in more than 16 bytes, those additional bytes will start to overwrite things that are after the buffer variable on the stack. Finally, we'll print the variable a to the screen to see its value. Let's go ahead and compile this with GCC so we can run it. One thing that we'll do is pass in the dash F no stack protector flag. This will disable several stack protections, one of which being the rearrangement of local variables on the stack. In later videos, we'll see how we can still exploit buffer overflows even with the stack protectors on. If we go ahead and run the program and pass less than 16 A's, then we see that when A is printed, there's nothing that has changed. Now if we type in a lot of A's, we see that A is a strange value and we got a segmentation fault and the program crashed. If we run Python 3 and we convert that value that we got from A into hex, we see that it is the hex value 414141, which correlates to 4 bytes of capital A. Let's get a more visual understanding of what happened here. Effectively, what we have is two variables pushed onto the stack. Integer a, which is set to the value of 10, and our buffer, which is 16 bytes and it's all initialized to zeros. When we gave scanf less than 16 bytes of input, it didn't do anything that interesting. It simply placed each byte into our buffer one at a time, just like we would have expected. Now let's reset our buffer and see what happens when we put in more than 16 bytes. And as you can see, when we get past the end of our buffer, we start to overwrite the bytes that make up integer A. And this is really powerful. It's the most basic version of a stack overflow, but it gives us our first write primitive. We are now able to affect data that lives on the stack that we were otherwise not intended to ever manipulate. Great. In this video, we've covered the very basics of a buffer overflow. In the next video, we're going to look at a challenge problem that utilizes this technique in order to capture the flag. In the following videos, we're going to go into more depth on the details of how the stack works and see if we can leverage buffer overflows to gain execution of our own code. We left out a lot of details, but this video will hopefully serve as the foundation for the future. If you liked today's video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell. It keeps you from missing out on future videos. Don't forget to feed your fish, and we'll see you next time.